Our next speaker will be Dr. David Rubin. Uh, David is uh, the Joseph B. Kirzner Professor of Medicine and the Chief of the Section of Gastroenterology, Hepatology, and Nutrition, also the co-director of the Digestive Diseases Center at the University of Chicago. David also currently serves as a faculty member at the McLean Center for Clinical Medical Ethics, where he and I and Andrew Aronson run the first year medical student course on ethics and the doctor-patient relationship. Um, David's research interests uh, are wide. They include the genetics of inflammatory bowel disease, um, novel uh, th uh, therapies, uh, for inflammatory bowel disease and colon cancer prevention, along with clinical medical ethics. David is the editor of a best-selling book on inflammatory bowel disease, now in its second edition, and an author or co-author of many, many peer-reviewed articles on IBD, genetic testing, and cancer in, in inflammatory bowel disease. Today, uh, David Rubin will speak to us on the topic are there ethical standards for health insurance companies? David Rubin. Thank you, Mark, and uh, it's an honor to be here again. And as many in this room know about how things like this happen, this was a page I received. Mark said, we'd like you to speak at our conference. What's your topic? <laughs> and I had just gotten off the phone doing a peer-to-peer -peer discussion with an insurance company on behalf of one of my patients. So um, this is a, a perfect uh, continuance of the two wonderful lectures we've heard. First from Andrew, where we heard about cures for hepatitis C and thought about how um, we as a healthcare organization and as society might support such a scientific advance. And now, of course, Stacy's um, discussion on how do we deliver care across the population, even at some minimal level, and uh, hopefully improve it. This is more about um, the story of individual patients and an individual provider, that person being me, and the questions I keep asking, which is, how can insurance companies get away with what they're getting away with so often? And in preparing this talk, I came to a couple conclusions. The first was, in answer to the question, are there ethical standards for health insurance companies, I still can't tell, despite reviewing what I could and reading uh, as much as possible on this topic. And secondly, in terms of should there be, um, I say emphatically yes. So hopefully I'll give you an outline of what I think should be occurring with the health insurance industry and with payers in general. I do have disclosures, and I am going to be speaking about a specific therapy for Crohn's disease, and I do consult for the company that has brought that uh, therapy to market, and the University of Chicago um, <coughs> treats patients with that therapy, as you'll soon see, uh, but I do not receive any equity uh, or other financial re remuneration for prescribing these therapies, of course. Um, I'm also involved in a couple other entities that I don't think are relevant to this presentation. A disclosure I didn't re remember to include but will mention is that I'm currently serving a three-year term as the Chair of Government and Industry Affairs for the Crohn's and Colitis Foundation, and they often send me problems that other members um, of the organization have encountered with uh, patients receiving therapy or payers providing the support that we believe they might need. I'll start with um, this, which actually I just received uh, last week from a patient. She brought in her bill. Uh, this is her bill for receiving a therapy called Eustachinumab for her Crohn's disease, which is the first line on this slide. You can see what the price was through the University of Chicago for one dose of this therapy, which is administered three times, uh, four times a year. Uh, and the other costs on here, including an MRI of the abdomen and pelvis. These are charges, of course. This isn't what anyone can pay. Um, but you can also see here that her total bill for outpatient services was $102,000. Medicare had a um, payment of $13,000. There was a discount for Medicare of $75,000. <laughs> How nice of them. Uh, and then some adjustment that I have no idea what it is followed by a Blue Cross payment because she has secondary insurance. She is not uh, over 59 or 65 yet. Um, and she was given this bill, which was for $12,000 that she was responsible for. And she could not 
afford it, despite being fully employed, um, but as being a single mother of two, she said to me, um, my Crohn's disease is better, but I can't pay this bill. Can you help me? So this is not uncommon, and everyone in the room who takes care of patients, I'm sure, encounters some version of this at some point. Um, but when you see the numbers on a piece of paper, it's quite dramatic. So that's my first case scenario. The second one is what leads to the discussion about health insurance ethical standards. And this is a, another patient, different from the one I just presented, a 25-year-old woman with newly diagnosed Crohn's. I'll remind you Crohn's is an immune condition of the intestinal tract often or most often affects young people, is a chronic condition, and is treated for the most part with immune-based uh, and immune-modifying therapies. She presents with the common symptoms of Crohn's disease, which is weight loss, diarrhea, abdominal pain, and anemia. And in discussion with her doctor, who is me, we decide to treat her with a new therapy called vetolizumab. Veto is a monoclonal antibody. This particular therapy is unique because it is the first therapy we've had that actually targets the immune system of the intestinal tract only. So unlike all the other therapies in the historical treatment of Crohn's disease in which we suppress the entire body's immune system, we now have a therapy that targets the lymphocytes that are on their way to the gut and only those lymphocytes, which accounts for about 5% of your circulating um, cellular immune system. By doing so, it offers benefit in controlling an intestinal immune disease, but does not have the risk of therapies that we've used before. In fact, the safety profile of this drug is the best one we've ever had. So we now have a therapy that we learned from uh, extensive clinical trials and FDA approval is effective for the disease, but offers the best safety profile that we've previously offered. Like other biological therapies um, and the standard of care previously anti-TNF biological therapies, it costs about $42,000 per year. And that's if you're getting it as an outpatient infusion center. If you get it in a hospital like ours, um, even if she wanted to get it here because she felt more comfortable doing so, uh, add another 50% to that charge because they upcharge it. The insurance company who requires pre-authorization, and any smart clinician and patient knows that they should get pre-authorization, denies therapy for vetalizumab. They say that they um, require the patient to fail these older therapies first before they can get to veto. That's a common strategy, um, or maybe not strategy, but policy of insurance companies. Newer therapies get tacked on at the end, they review the label, they think about where it should be positioned. I should note that the label for betalizumab does not require patients to fail the anti-TNF therapies or really to fail anything else before getting it. So that's important to know. But they tell us we have to use the anti-TNF therapy first. And um, despite a discussion, which I won't go into, we agree to start another therapy, the anti-TNF, the <coughs> systemically active drug that we've used for a number of years. Now, if it worked, we might have a different thought about all this, but unfortunately it didn't work. And about 60% of our patients do not respond to these therapies. So this is not uncommon. We give her her loading doses, we give her a couple of maintenance doses of this therapy, and she has had no improvement in her disease symptoms. Now a standard way, and this is across the entire field, to assess non-response to therapy is you measure a drug level. So we obtain a drug level. Well. The first thing that happens is the insurance company says that the drug level uh, assessment was experimental and they deny coverage for that. Then they, um, we asked them, well, can we give her vetalizumab now? We did what you asked and they said, oh, sorry, we have a two-step failure process. You need to give her another drug in the same class that works by the exact same mechanism as the one that just didn't work before we'll let you consider vetalizumab. That's called a two-step failure. Um, it's a policy that many insurance companies had adopted. And I will tell you, without getting into um, how we learn all this, that the reason for this has nothing to do with the science of taking care of Crohn's disease. It has everything to do with the contracts they have with the companies that sell these drugs and provide them. So the insurance company has agreements with the companies that make adalimumab and infliximab and the other drugs that are in the same class, um, which have been around for a while, that they get a discount by um, using those therapies. And therefore, despite the fact that on paper they look like they all cost the same, um, the insurance companies have their conflict, which is related to their fiduciary responsibilities and their attempt to keep uh, money flowing properly um, in, in uh, recommending or mandating the use of these other therapies before you can go to this newer one, which hadn't been around long enough and they hadn't been smart enough, perhaps, to price themselves or to develop a contract with this company.
So I'm left with a patient who we think would benefit from a therapy which is safer than the others, who's already failed one, and now I'm told I have to give her another expensive therapy that is the exact same mechanism that failed in this uh, patient already. So there are many questions we can ask, and I'm not answering them all here. I can't. But first of all, am I providing standard of care therapy? Well, everyone in the room who knows standard of care um, might say, well, this is a new drug, just came to market. It might not be standard of care yet. So perhaps there is an argument to support insurance saying this isn't quite where we need to be yet. I'm willing to uh, actually uh, say that that's possible. Um, does the insurance company have the right to refuse coverage? Well, of course they do. That's at the, in their contract, in their agreement with the patient. Um, what are my ethical responsibilities to the patient, however? I still have a patient who I think would benefit from this mechanism. I'm convinced more now that she needs it. Um, and I also want her to have a therapy that's safe, and so does she. Um, and do I have an ethical responsibility to pay her? I think I do. I have to be responsible enough not to recommend therapies that I think aren't going to work uh, or to use resources unwisely. Does the physician have an ethical obligation to recommend therapy that's only covered by the payer so she doesn't get the bill for that blood test I ordered of her drug level? Well, we might say sure, um, but then I would actually turn to um, all of my physician colleagues and say, how often can you actually know that when you're ordering a blood test especially? Now we're learning with our electronic medical records what therapies are covered and we can sometimes make decisions. Maybe we do. I certainly have a discussion with patients about how are you going to pay for this when you get a bill. And lastly, and what I'll spend the rest of my time on, does the payer have an ethical obligation to the patient, which they call members, how nice of them. Um, what is their ethical obligation to the member and to me? So I um, would like to make this, the argument that insurance companies in particular have special obligations and unique power and therefore should be held to a standard that we should enforce and consider um, I wouldn't necessarily go so far as saying regulating, but certainly um, broadly discussing. Um, I think that that's because, first of all, this isn't a, a simple contract agreement with uh, individuals like any other business. I think when we start talking about health care and taking care of people uh, and uh, in the extremes, of course, life and death, there are special obligations that are distinct. The obligations are for the insurance company to understand what the standard of care is. We often encounter um, insurance companies who don't know anything about inflammatory bowel disease. They instead take um, what is known about a different disease state that uses similar therapies and copy and paste that entire policy into their section of their manual. They uh, have an obligation to be apprised of updates in care that may change the efficacy and safety ratios or affect outcomes in demonstrable ways. So in the extreme, Andrew taught us that uh, we can cure hepatitis C. Everyone learned about that and was very interested in it right away. Mm -hmm. But insurance companies weren't paying attention about this drug. It sort of snuck up on them that it had a completely different mechanism. And the reason they weren't paying as much attention is there are many fewer people with inflammatory bowel disease than there are with rheumatoid arthritis and other diseases which don't get treated by this new drug. Um, they also have, in my opinion, an obligation to provide transparency related to their denial decisions. I would like to know what their contract agreement is with uh, AbbVie or with Janssen Pharmaceuticals that leads them to require two-step failures when a patient has a primary non-response to the first drug. I also think insurance companies have unique power that can be um, cost effective when used properly to mandate prevention, to enforce certain health behaviors like smoking cessation, um, and to engage in disease management. In fact, there's an entire industry of disease management companies that work with insurance companies to help make sure their patients are getting what would be considered to be appropriate care and I've been involved in some of that. I'll remind you that health insurance exists because at the bottom line, health care and the delivery of health care in its current state is really not affordable for anybody, regardless of their resources, but certainly there are those who are at higher risk. And the general idea of providing good health care is to provide people with the range of opportunities that they are somehow entitled to for good health and what they can get out of life. And health insurance is supposed to provide you with financial security. Everyone here has heard and understands a little bit about the challenge of distributive justice and understanding how do you somehow figure out how um, people can all support one another in a health insurance company, and actuarials can teach us a lot about this. Um, but we run into some challenges when care becomes too expensive, and we already heard that from Andrew. 
Um, so the general idea then becomes how do you balance equity with the uh, efficiency and effectiveness? And so we can break this down into a number of different uh, potential problems. The first one is providing care to the greatest number but with lesser benefits versus providing the most care to a smaller number, like we heard from Andrew. The second is the obligation to provide care at all versus the obligation to shareholders to be profitable. So what insurance companies do when their quarterly earnings don't look as good as they thought is they just tweak up everyone's premium um, amounts, and we all have seen that. Uh, and that's how they can continue to be profitable. But I think that if they're able to do that, they have an obligation to reinvest in providing better care. And they certainly have an obligation to know what the science of medicine is providing. Um, there's a necessity to embrace cost-effective care compared to um, embracing newer therapies that might change things but are expensive. And then there's the established standard of care practice versus the emerging evidence-based practices and the patient and provider expectations and assumptions for coverage, which are often confusing, as we all know, versus the reality of the limitations that are there, where they're always saying things like, oh, well, if you had read our letter, you had 14 days to appeal, and now it's day 17, sorry. That's real, that happens. So my position is that payers have an ethical obligation to use their resources to provide the best care to the most patients, and that I'm not seeing. And therefore, I'm proposing that they should, one, invest in appropriate expertise and education about advances in disease management. There's not been any appropriate way that that's been done, at least in the field that I work in, in GI. Two, actively seek information regarding new therapies as opposed to waiting for us to either sneak it past them because it's under the radar or fighting about it um, like I've been doing every day since these drugs got approved. Three, recognize conflicts of interest related to their fiduciary responsibilities and be transparent about them. Um, and provide transparency for reasons that they're favoring one therapy over another. It's so bad that sometimes they tell me on the phone that they, I should treat my patient with a drug that isn't even approved for Crohn's disease and colitis. And then I ask the person I'm speaking to, um, why is that? And the person says, I'm not sure. I'm an orthopedic surgeon who works for an insurance company. I wish I was making that up. Um, five, I think they should fund clinical research. With all the changes in our ability to uh, secure funding for good comparative effectiveness studies, when they say to me, well, there's never been a head-to-head -head trial of adalimumab compared to betalizumab, so we can't agree with you that it's better or safer, um, I'd like them to then say, but we're willing to fund a study to look at it, and then I'd be willing to have their skin in the game and talk about it. Um, and lastly, of course, they should provide cost-effective care, which should focus on all the things that we know work, but they don't necessarily spend as much time, in part previously because we knew that if they spent the money on prevention, um, it was not necessarily going to reap benefits to them because people often switch jobs, switch insurance companies, and were downstream by the time the return on the investment might be uh, realized. So that's a challenge that we uh, certainly face. So what else can we do? And this is the last part of my presentation. Um, this is not the same patient I just presented, so I've given you three different real-world scenarios. This is something that I ended up doing, and I'm not necessarily saying that you should all do it, but I hope you do. Um, I got off the phone with United Healthcare recently, who was refusing reauthorization for uh, a therapy that was actually working for maintenance. So my patient was in remission, and they required that we prove that it's still working, which we did, and then they said, sorry, we're not going to prove it. Um, that's not standard of care. So I was, uh, after one hour on the phone with five different people, um, during which time I was also told that my um, window for a peer-to-peer -peer discussion had expired, uh, and the patient told me that the letter she received was um, dated a month earlier, and that's why it had expired. Um, I tweeted it. I happen to have a, a fairly large following of, uh, in Twitter, which is all related to inflammatory bowel disease, um, and this was my tweet. United Healthcare denies patients who are in stable remission on effective therapy, their meds, even with peer-to-peer -peer discussion. So um, there were lots of comments. Um, I'm not going to read them all to you, but I'll pick a few specific ones, including some from around the world, uh, where um, we were reminded by my friend in Chile that it's worse there. Um, and there were lots of views um, of this particular comment. Um, then I actually had found out about the 14-day peer-to-peer uh, window. Um, so then I said, United Healthcare gives 14 days for a peer-to-peer -peer discussion after denial. My patient received her denial letter after the 14 days had already expired. Clever. And now I started tagging United Healthcare on my tweets. So <laughs> for those who don't know Twitter, that means that they're getting these messages now. Um, and people 
commented. There were lots of views on this one. Uh, then I got a little, I was obviously very, <laughs> had some time on my hands and was very aggravated this day. Insurance companies don't know and worse appear not to care about downstream savings. Deny it now, pay more later. Because that's what would happen if you deny a maintenance therapy in a patient who's already doing well. Maybe someone else pays then. Lots of comments about this. Uh, my colleague Fernando is in Spain. He's commenting on it. Um, all sorts of com comments. Um, then I decided to tweet their quarterly earnings. <laughs> so this is United Healthcare doing better than expected under Obamacare. Um, people got a kick out of that one. And then um, after 48 hours of my campaign, <laughs> they did approve the care. It's the power of social media or, or a funny coincidence, I'm not sure. Uh, so then I concluded with uh, what I would conclude with today, which is I, I would like to hold insurance companies to a higher standard. I do believe they have an ethical obligation to payers, to, to providers and to patients. I would like to see them investing in um, more uh, science and more cost-effective care. Um, I don't necessarily hold them responsible for saying a brand new therapy can be positioned ahead of standard of care. That was something I, I thought about a lot, um, and I'm not saying that that's necessary, but I certainly think there are many uh, areas that are room for improvement. That was one of the comments of one of my patients who follows me on Twitter. <laughs> So um, I appreciate the opportunity to think about something new which has been troubling me and we struggle with every day. Um, and it's a little bit more individualized than some of the more um, global discussions we've had so far this morning. Um, but I, I, I intend to pursue this actively through my role in the Crohn's and Colitis Foundation and I hope that I've given all of you some things to think about so that you can help us in this dis discussion. Thank you. David's paper is open for a question of you or a comment. <clears throat> Let me ask very quickly. Many industries have codes of ethics. Uh, does the insur health insurance industry or individual insurers uh, maintain such a code? I couldn't find it. And I even asked some contacts I had at Blue Cross Blue Shield. There, there doesn't appear to be an industry-wide code like that. There are certainly business ethics that they adhere to, but not related to um, patient care. Peter. I tweeted about the price of drugs. I have. Uh, Peter asked if I had tweeted about the cost of drugs, because that's certainly um, something else that we could be talking about today, is um, how do we uh, bring down the cost of therapy, which is driving this, because it's not sustainable. If we had everyone on the therapies, and if we actually, it's another talk entirely, if we actually treated everyone with Crohn's disease to the um, endpoints that we're now talking about, we won't be able to do it. Absolutely agree. And next year, I may be talking about the emergence of biosimilars, in the U.S. market, which will drive the price down by at least 35%. David, thanks so much. <laughs>